Hello, everyone, and glad you can attend Attitudes Weekly ADHD Experts webinar. Just an introductory note before we get started. If you've listened to one of our webinars before, you'll know we've been experimenting with adding a certificate of attendance. When the webinar ends, a post-event sur survey will pop up. It will list three questions about the quality of the webinar, followed by three questions titled, Required for Certificate. If you would like a certificate of attendance emailed to you, then you should answer those three questions. If you don't want a certificate, then you don't have to answer them. So let's get on to today's topic. Uh, it's especially timely for parents raising children with ADHD. We're all back into back to school mode. Some of you, depending on your state and locale, have been doing that for several weeks now. Other than getting our kids up and out the door, homework is one of the biggest challenges we all face. Today we have education expert Ann Dolan here to help us win the homework wars. She'll give us our be her best strategies for contending with nightly homework and for keeping children on task during the next 10 months. Anne has more than 25 years of teaching and tutoring experience. A former public school teacher, she founded Educational Connections, a tutoring and test prep company in the Washington, D.C. area. Her fir first book, Homework Made Simple, won the Publishers Association 2011 Parent Book of the Year Award. Her new book is Getting Past Procrastination, How to Get Your Kids Organized, Focused, and Motivated Without Being the Bad Guy. I love that title. Um, you can ask questions of Anne any time during the webinar. We will try to get to as many of them as we can. And just so you know, to download the presentation slides of this webinar, click the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources on the bottom left of your screen. If you do not see the Event Resources tab, you need to refresh your page. So now, finally, let me to turn it over to Anne. And it's great to have you here today to help us out on this important topic, Anne. Thank you so much, Wayne. It's great to be here. You know, every day parents call our office looking for help for their kids. And they often say similar things like, oh my gosh, helping my kid with homework, it feels like a full-time job. And I already have a job. Many will say, I'm giving so much attention to this one child and I've got other kids too. Sometimes parents ask, well, if it's this hard now, what's it gonna be like in the future? And ultimately what parents say is that they feel like they've had to take on this role of homework police. They have to poke, prod, cajole, do anything to get their kids to focus and finish. So here's what I know after working with lots of kids over many years, these are not character flaws in our kids. It's not that they're unmotivated or they just don't want to do the work, but often their executive functions are weak. And every student with ADHD has some weak executive functioning skills. So we know that these issues are really tied to the frontal lobe of the brain. And for our kids with ADHD, they just don't mature as fast as other kids. So when it comes to homework, a 12-year-old might have the focus skills of like a nine or a 10-year-old. And their executive functioning skills are along the same lines. Now, when it comes to executive function, it's really a form of self-regulation. I kind of call it fuzzy focus in a way. You know, our kids often have a hard time with many things that are important to homework success. Just even getting started, you know, beginning in the first place, that's a self-regulation skill. Can you put down Snapchat and start that math homework? And then once you get started, can you resist distractions? If your brother is playing on the other side of the room, can you put that aside and focus enough on your math? And can you sustain your effort well enough to finish that assignment? It also has to do things with things like planning ahead. If you have something due on Thursday and it's Monday, can you think ahead to get that done by Thursday? And then lastly, it's the consequences that sometimes our kids don't recall too well. Oh, what was it like before when I waited until the last minute to get that work done? Sometimes they don't always remember those hard times. The good news is that executive functions do get better over time. But kids with ADHD, as I mentioned, they're just delayed in these areas. 
and it especially hits them hard in these transition years, years with greater workload. So in elementary school, it could be from going to say third to fourth grade, when you're no longer learning to read, but you're reading to learn. It almost always happens in sixth or seventh grade, depending on when your middle school is. And then in ninth grade, always, <laughs> freshman year, we see so many kids that struggle with that transition. And then often again in 11th grade, when kids are going from just taking the general classes to more advanced classes and an even greater homework load. So what often happens is that kids that are perfectly capable of doing well, there's nothing wrong with their cognitive capacity, just do not turn in the right work or what they turn in isn't so great. They don't study very well, so their grades are not indicative of their real natural intelligence. So there's this disconnect between their ability and their performance. And that's what's so frustrating. It's frustrating to parents, and it's also frustrating to kids. But on the side of parents, that's when they really become the homework police. You know, that's when they tend to get involved and want to right the ship to make sure their kids are on task. Well, here's the thing, you know, when it comes to helping kids with homework, we don't want that role of homework place. So hopefully in this webinar, you'll get a couple of strategies to take you out of that role. Uh, I wanna share with you some systems that you can use at home, even if maybe organization is hard for you. And that's where I wanna start as this organization piece. I've created a page on my website that might be really helpful to folks. It has a lot of videos and articles and things that I'm gonna talk about today. So if you want to go to my website, that's, that one page is a plethora of great things. And it's ectutoring, ectutoring.com slash web. So let's talk about those basic organization skills. There's some simple things that parents can do, and I want to start out with one thing that I love to use with kids that I've found great success over the years, and it's a simple homework folder. You may have remembered when your child was older and first, younger in first grade, they got this like, super easy homework folder, and when they got an assignment in class, they tucked it into the left-hand pocket, and when they finished it at night, they put it on the right-hand side. Well, a homework folder has actually been proven by research to help kids with ADHD a whole lot because studies show that kids with ADHD turn in about 12% fewer assignments. And sometimes it's not that they didn't do the work, it's just that they cannot find the work. I had this kid once when I taught fourth grade and his name was Kevin. And Kevin, I loved him. He was just a fabulous kid. And inevitably, when I would call for homework, I could just see his eyes light up. He was kind of like a deer in headlights. And he'd start to scurry through his desk, looking for his homework, trying to find it in these, you know, in any way he could inside his desk. And then he would raise his hand and say, Mrs. Dolan, can I go to my backpack? We had a closet for backpacks to see if I can find um, my homework. Can I look through my backpack? And then he'd come back to his desk and he'd say, I can't find it anywhere, but I did it. And it was so frustrating for him. And poor Kevin, he didn't have any systems. So what I found for him is that when he had this homework folder, we figured out that this was his issue. He didn't have one place because maybe one day he'd shove it in his backpack. The next day he'd leave it on the kitchen counter. The third day, um, he might stick it in a random folder. Woody always had a place to put it when he got it in school in the left pocket. And when he always had the same place to put it when he finished that right pocket, he was turning in a whole lot more assignments. Another thing that you could consider is a launching pad. I love launching pads, and basically the idea is that kids need to be getting ready the night before for the following morning. And I'll often share with my students, you know, Listen, your homework is not done until it's in your homework folder. Your homework folder is in your binder, your binder is in your backpack, and your backpack is in your launching pad. So the launching pad is really in a box, I don't know, it could be an old dish pan, and it goes somewhere that you see it all the time. It could, be go, it could go by the door from which your child exits in the morning. But the idea is they get all their stuff ready the night before, so they're launching into a new day in the morning in an organized fashion. Another strategy that could be helpful, and again, you don't need to pick all these, but think, is there one that could work for me here, is called the clean sweep. And a clean sweep is basically a time every week, everybody in, on, in, in the family is in on organization. Many of our kids can start out the year perfectly neat. 
And we know this because we bring them to Staples or Office Depot and they have the best color coded binders in the whole school. But you look in their binder a week later and it looks nothing like it did on that first day. And part of the reason is our kids don't have a system for maintaining neatness. So the clean sweep is basically an appointment. Program it in your phone, same time each week, maybe Sunday after dinner from say seven to 7.20. And during that time, Everybody in your whole family, not just your disorganized kid, are in, in, the, in on the act of getting organized. So for kids, it might be sorting through their papers and making sure they're in the right folder in their binder. It could be organizing the loose items on their desktop if they do a lot of homework online. It could be tidying up their homework area or cleaning out their backpack. For a parent, it could be cleaning out that junk drawer for organizing files. But the idea is that it's weekly. So that routine of maintenance helps kids stay as tidy as they can throughout the school year. So we talked about some basic things, but there are also some more advanced things parents can do. One thing that I found to be helpful is maybe about once a month, help your child clean out their backpack. I've noticed that in this day and age, Kids don't really use lockers like they did five or even six or seven years ago. So much of what kids have now is just kept in their backpack and they go from class to class like that. So having an organized backpack is super, super important. So the idea is CAT with a K stands for keep, archive, or toss. So when they go through their backpack, they take out those loose things and they have three choices. They can keep it and put it back into the right place. They can archive it, which I'll talk about in a second, or they can toss it. Archiving is really the things that kids want to keep that might be important later. Maybe an old test or quiz, because teachers, as kids get older, take new exam problems from old tests and quizzes. It could be a study guide. Some kids with ADHD just like to keep everything, and it's hard to get them to throw away anything, and that's okay, too. So the idea is they just need to get it out of their backpack if they're not using it anymore, and they can archive it. They could put it in a file folder system, like the one I have pictured here, the hanging colored pen to flex file. Or they can just put it in stacks. But the idea is just to get it out of that main place they're, they're working from, which is in their backpack. So how do you get started with something with the organization? Well, you don't want to pick everything, but pick one thing that you think you might be able to implement consistently. And then you wouldn't want to say, listen, Jimmy, I was on a webinar today with a homework lady, and she said we should do a homework folder. Probably not going to go over too well. I don't know about your kids, but my kids, they just never like to be told what to do. But instead, you could ask for an appointment. Oh, could we talk about getting organized tonight after dinner? How about 7.30? And then you can name the problem. Let's say you want to use a launching pad. You might say, mornings have been really difficult for us, us in the past. I'm wondering if we can try something different this year. You could also say, this might work for us. This might not. Could we try it out for a couple of days? That often gets kids to have a little bit more buy-in. So when it comes to managing time and planning ahead, there are actually two ways I think of people. You know, some people are like TikTok.com and some people are last minute Lucy's. And I'm wondering how you see your child. Um, everybody has this internal sense of time. And for some, our, our clock ticks loudly. We're well aware of time. But for other people, this sense of where we are in the day with time, it's just kind of, it's just a little bit harder to, to um, know where you are. I call those people last minute Lucy's. Here's an example. Let's say you got two kids and um, both kids have to be at the bus stop at 7.15. The alarm goes off at 6.30 for both kids. Now, TikTok Tom, the alarm goes off at 6.30 and he says to himself, hmm, I better get in the shower because I need to be out of the shower by 6.45 in order to get dressed, brush my hair, be downstairs and eat breakfast at seven and be out the door at 7.05. For him, time ticks loudly. Now, last minute Lucy also hears her alarm clock at 6.30 and she says, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna check Snapchat really quick. She goes on Snapchat and before she knows it, it's 6.50. Oh boy, now she has to hurry up, jump in the shower. By the time she gets out, out it's five after seven. Mom's yelling at her, but Lucy's still blow drying her hair. She runs downstairs, grabs something out of the refrigerator, by the way, she forgot to brush her teeth, and books it down the street to the bus stop. Sometimes she's on time and sometimes she's not. That's last minute Lucy. 
Now, I can tell you that in general, these two kids also have a time horizon. I love this concept that comes from my friend, um, Ari Tuckman, who's great with adults and ADHD. And the idea is, if two people, if two kids get an assignment on Monday and both kids have the assignment due on Friday, they're gonna handle it differently. So the child with a long time horizon, they get the assignment on Monday, they may say to themselves, look, I can't get it started tonight because I have a rehearsal, but I can chip away at it Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe a little bit Friday, Thursday to turn it on Friday. So their time horizon is long, it's from Tuesday to Friday. But the kid with a short time a short time horizon says on Monday, well, this time it's going to be different. I'm going to start it early this time, but inevitably it's Thursday night at 10 o'clock and they're just getting started. That student has a short time horizon from Thursday to Friday. So it's typically the case that last minute Lucy's also have short time horizons and TikTok comms have long time horizons. So I'm just curious, when it comes to you personally, what category do you fit into? And then think about your child. Where do they fit? Here's the thing. We often think, wouldn't it be nice to have a TikTok Tom? Wow, that would be so much easier for me. And this is true. I mean, I will tell you that I think school is designed for TikTok Tom. And last minute, Lucy is going to have a harder time in school unless she develops some strategies to help her. But the thing is that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. And I've seen lots of kids that are like TikTok comms feel very anxious. And on its own, anxiety can cause procrastination. It's just that these kids procrastinate for different reasons. They often procrastinate because they're worried if they get started and the outcome isn't just what they want. It's not perfect. Why bother? So here's the question. Why do both of these kids procrastinate in the first place? Well, the truth is our brain hates change. You know, if we're on Instagram and now we have to do math, our brain doesn't like it. It doesn't say, oh, yeah, let's start math. It's so fun. It's going to feel great. No, our brain says that's big. It's hard. It's difficult. Why do I want to do that? So we have to trick our brain into making it feel like getting started is actually kind of easy. And we can do that a couple of ways. I teach kids how to do it by time and by task. Okay, so here is time. First of all, I'm a huge fan of timers. I love timers. I love timers for kindergartners. I love timers for college students. Timers, especially the time timer, which is one of my favorite, um, is so easy to use. So when kids are younger, I'll teach them how to use it. So I'll have them set it for a very short period of time, like 10 minutes. I call this a tolerable pen. The idea is that anybody can tolerate anything for 10 minutes. So they set the timer for 10 minutes and they say to themselves, I'm gonna work as hard as I can, as best I can, I'm gonna focus as much as I can for just 10 minutes. And then when the timer goes off, I can take a break or I, keep on, I can keep on going. Typically, they can keep on going, but they need the timer to get them started. Same for chunking my tasks. Here's the idea. Oh, I don't want to write this English essay. It feels overwhelming. But you know what? I'm just going to tell my brain all I'm going to do is write the topic sentence, and then I can take a break. And that often can get them started. I've also found that kids feel they have to be in the right mood to get started, which is actually not true at all. They just have to get going. And sometimes they can use these small pockets of time to get going. I'll call them weird windows. The idea with weird windows is you need this small amount of time that you would typically be on probably social media to get going. So it might be at 20 minutes you're waiting for your allergy shot appointment. Or maybe you're taking the bus um, to your lacrosse practice and you have a half hour. These are times that kids can get a small amount of work done. That's called a weird window. But other times, it's just not about getting something small done. Other times, kids feel really overwhelmed by the amount of work they have to do. Whether they're ADHD or not, sometimes just this feeling of overwhelm is common in today's day and age. We'll often teach our kids to prioritize their assignments by must do, should do, could do. So must do is, all right, I absolutely have to get this assignment done because it's new due the next day. Should do is, yeah, I should do this tonight, but if I don't, 
it's not a huge deal because it's actually not due tomorrow. And could do's are things like, you know what, I already studied a lot for this quiz. Do I have to study more? Maybe not. Maybe that can come off the to-do list. So for an anxious child, pri prioritizing their assignments into must-do, should-do, could-do can really cut down on that feeling of overwhelm. So I probably talked about fuzzy focus in the beginning, and this is true of many of our kids. They need to be in this optimal environment to get started and to get focused. And so the time at which kids do homework is really, really important. I found that for younger kids, especially those that are on medication, generally starting homework right after school or after about a 30 minute break or so is a good amount of time. Now, older kids will often want to start late in the evening, and this is not a good idea because they're starting too late, they stay up too late at night, and then it's hard to get them out of bed in the morning. So for those kids, having a routine and, for example, everybody in our house starts homework before dinner or right after dinner is when we start homework. Those are all good times. But right before bed, or kids have even told me before school the next day, and that's when I start, probably not a great time. Having that routine is helpful, especially when kids are younger. In elementary school, if we can get a routine going, even set the timer for 30 minutes, and when the timer goes off, it's start, time to start homework, it really prevents a lot of pushback if it's a different time every day. And the place kids do homework is important. You know, sometimes parents will say, I always want my kid to do homework at this desk sitting down. But I tell you, a lot of our kids, they've been sitting down for seven hours all day, sitting down to do homework again. It's just not helpful to them. So they might do be better doing homework standing up at the um, kitchen counter, for example, or on their back um, on the couch. Um, some kids need multiple places to do homework, and they tend to do well in kind of semi-quiet places like um, maybe the dining room or the home office. So some kids can be in the thick of things at the, dining, at the kitchen table. It kind of depends. So I often encourage kids to be a detective, to try a couple places out, but it doesn't have to be at a desk the same place every day. I will tell you when kids are young, if you can prevent them from doing homework in their bedroom, it's a good thing. I find that often as kids get older, they can turn into Super Bowl kids. <laughs> We've all watched the Super Bowl. It's on for such a long time. It's on for like four hours, but they only play the game for an hour. And sometimes this can happen with our kids for homework. They go up to do what like, might not be that much homework, you know, maybe an hour's worth, and they're up in the rooms for three, four hours. And the reason they're Super Bowl kids is because they're distracted. You know, so when they're young, we can control the distraction a little bit more by where they do homework. We can even give them fidget toys. Um, fidget toys are great if you have a kid who's always rocking back and forth or clicking their mechanical pencil, they're always touching things. Give them a fidget toy. But when they're older, they may need other ways to help focus their, um, their time, if they have that fuzzy focus. And that's where technology can come in. I really like a couple of apps that were actually kid recommended to me, and I found them to be super successful with a lot of kids we've worked with over the years. And this is when we help kids with executive functioning coaching. It's not always that they need help with a subject, but they need help with more of these um, self-awareness skills. So these are a couple ones that I found great success with that you could maybe mention to your kids. They may already use them. But one is for Max, and this is when kids have a lot of homework online, which is just inherently super distracting for all kids, but even worse for kids with ADHD. And the other is a Chrome extension safe called Stay Focused, and they both pretty much do the same thing. So the idea is that I will tell you, kids generally know which websites are distracting to them. It's fantasy football season. They might be on Yahoo Fantasy Sports, or who knows, they could be internet shopping on Amazon, or maybe they're watching three hours of YouTube videos. So it allows them to blacklist the websites they deem to be distract distracting, so they're in control. And then they move a toggle bar, and the toggle bar um, they can set for any amount of time. Say that they want to stay focused for 20 minutes of studying. They set it for 20 minutes. No matter what they do, if they try to um, disable the app or restart the computer, they cannot get to those blacklisted websites. There's also one for the phone that I love. Kids will often say, I need my phone, Mom, to do homework. I don't buy it. They usually don't need their phone. 
But if this is a battle, here's one that kids um, have found to be super helpful. It's called Forest. And Forest, when you click on it, um, it asks you, how long do you want to stay focused for? And you can, I recommend to kids all the time, don't pick like an hour, pick like 15 minutes. And once you set the timer for 15 minutes, the tree will start to grow on the home screen of your phone and it will get bigger and leaves will develop. But if at any time, you go to YouTube or you go to Instagram or even go to Snapchat, it will give you a warning. Get focused. You've got two seconds to get back. And your tree will continue to grow. And if you can sustain your focus for a whole 15 minutes, you get this tree planted in your forest. It's super motivating to kids and it really does keep them focused. Now, when it comes to time, um, there's definitely this optimal amount. You know, if kids are only planning for what they have to do that day, and to be honest, most of our kids with ADHD rarely plan at all. But if they're just thinking about, okay, I just got to do this for homework tonight, it's actually too short. But if we as parents have the expectation that they should look a month ahead, that's completely unrealistic and it's too long. But thinking about time as a week at a time, it's, it's about right. So as parents, how do we help our kids to think ahead for the week? Well, I personally love using Sundays as this launching time for the week, this launching pad time. And it's a time when um, with my own kids, I will ask them, now they're older, but back in the day, I would say, tell me what you have coming up this week, which basically meant, do you have any big projects or tests? So it would be a time that they would go online to their portal and they would take a look. But often, one of my sons, if I didn't prompt him, he would not do this on his own. So it was a time that he just kind of took on Sundays, just took a few minutes to look ahead at the week. And sometimes I would ask him things like, do you have anything else coming up that could get in your way of, of getting that studying done for that test? You know, do you have a baseball game this week or what do you have that could get in your way? So setting aside time to talk about the week ahead can be hugely helpful for our kids. Now, if you don't mind, um, I want to just take a break for a second. I've been talking a lot and bring you back to a time when we had no technology. Um, it was actually 1984, and I don't really know if you remember your age in 1984. I can tell you I was 14 years old, and um, I was sitting in my um, eighth grade algebra class, and I vividly remember this. I looked up at the door at the board and I saw my teacher droning on about how to solve yet another algebra problem. And I just remember feeling so tense, like my neck hurt and my shoulders ached. And I thought to myself, I'm never going to get this math. And, you know, it was interesting at home. My parents knew I was having a hard time in math. Um, and, oh, I've got this slide, my favorite one. <laughs> I was talking about 1984. Um, just to give it some um, a time frame that might help you, it was a time in General Hospital and Luke and Laura and Three's company, if that rings a bell. Um, and so my dad, well, my dad was an engineer and he loved math, he loved numbers. So like, really, who better to help me with my math than my dad? So I remember this particular night, he comes into my room and he's like, don't worry, Ann, I'm gonna help you with this math. So we sit down at my little yellow Ethan Ellen desk and we start working through this, the first problem. And we get to the end and I said, dad, okay, I got it, it's negative two. He's like, well, it's not negative two, it's just two. I'm like, no, it's negative two because I did this up here. He's like, no, that's not how you do it. You do it this way. This is how you do it. And we just like completely um, could not see eye to eye. And my dad, who was always super mild mannered and he never really got that upset. He was so mad at me that he got up in an a moment of utter frustration his face was red and his lips were pursed he stands up he takes my math book and as hard as he can he throws it into the wall and papers scatter everywhere and i get up and i look at him and i'm like dad oh my gosh what are you doing it was a math problem and my dad had best intentions but he just had a hard time getting through to me and I remember that particular day when he threw the math book at me. My mom came into my room. She's like, that's it. You're not helping her anymore, and I'm getting you a tutor. <laughs> but the thing is, at the time, my dad didn't really know how to help me, which is true. You know, sometimes we're in the moment of helping our kids with homework, and we're just at our wit's end. 
Well, here's the thing. When our kids are stuck, we can do three things to help them. We can uh, tell them this is how you do it, which is what happened with me and my dad. He wanted to tell me how to do it. And that's not how I learned how to do it in class. It's not how my teacher taught me. Um, another option is we could say, it's your homework, not mine. I already went to fifth grade. You do it, I'm not getting involved. But then if our kids really have a hard time later on, they may not come to us because we're not willing to help so much. Um, the third option is, are there examples in your books or do you have any notes in this? That way we're trying to help our kids go back and see if they can find the answer somewhere else. And we can buy them. We can even find it in their book for them. But the idea is that we want to look to see if there's been a way they've been taught. So in general, not telling kids what to do is key. Um, that also can come in the form of powerful questions instead of telling kids what to do. You know, one thing that we often ask kids when they walk through the door is, do you have homework today? And I tell you, the answer is pretty much always yes, but sometimes our kids say no. Um, it's not a great question because it's either yes or no, and it could be the wrong answer, not the right answer that we want to hear. So a better question is, what are your priorities today? Now, in a perfect world, our daughter is going to say, well, let's see, mom, I have that English essay to do. I need to finish that chemistry lab. And oh, yes, I have that math assignment I have to do. Chances are that will never, ever happen. But by asking what are your priorities today and what might you do first, second, or maybe third, it really does help kids to fire off those executive functioning skills. And even if they don't verbalize what they're going to do, it does help them to start thinking in their mind what they're going to do first and second. It's a great question for kids that tend to procrastinate. And it's also a really good question for those kids that are overly anxious and tend to see everything as a big priority. Other powerful questions that I really like are, did you, instead of, did you study for your science test? You might say, what's the first thing that you might do to get ready? So it takes studying and it makes it feel easier because remember our brain hates change. Our brain might not want to study, but we might do something little, like we might um, get on Quizlet and practice those vocab cards or those vocab words we have to know. Instead of you better start that history project, we could ask, oh, what's something small you could do to get started? Those are good, powerful questions. Um, as a, as an um, executive functioning coach and a tutor, my favorite question, it's harder for parents to pull this off, but I always found great success with um, on a scale of one to 10. On a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling about your English exam? You know, if a kid says to me, I'm a five, I don't say a five, why are you a five? Well, you better get studying. No, I say, oh, a five, tell me about that. And often kids will say, well, I have this study guide. I've only done half of it. I really need to do the whole thing. And I'll say, oh, okay, tell me more. Well, I think tonight I might get started on that. And before I know it, they solve their own problem. But it's not by me telling them what to do. It's by me asking them questions. So at the end of the day, I personally think when it comes to dealing with our kids that can be difficult with homework, it really comes down to communication and ultimately listening. And my very favorite book on the whole entire topic is How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and How to Listen So Kids Will Talk. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And just to wrap up, lastly, um, help your kids advocate for themselves now, at the beginning of school, and asking for help in small, specific ways. Our kids often don't want to raise their hand. They don't um, want to go after school and ask for help. But even if it's something like, you know, encourage them to go and ask about number five. They're not going to go and say, I need help with math, but they might say, can I get some help with number five? Or writing an email. Don't ask your child to write an email by themselves. They're not going to do it. Help them write the first one, because if they get a positive response back from their teacher, they're more likely to do it on their own later on. 
So find outside help. If you've got a homework resistant kid, find out what the school offers. A lot of schools have homework clubs. Setting your kid up for it, even if they don't want to go. I did that with my younger son who has ADHD. It was a non-negotiable. He went to this homework club after school. A college student can help your child with homework. You know, ideally it's a professional tutor or an executive functioning coach, but that can be a little bit expensive. So find other ways um, to enlist help. But basically I tell you that a lot of people are better at this than mom or dad. And even if we have all the right answers, we might just not be the right messenger, even though we have the right message. So. I want to share with you those free resources again on my website with a lot of things I've talked about today. It's EC Tutoring, E as in Edward, C as in Pat, tutoring.com slash web. And here's my contact information. I'm super available. Email is best for me, Ann, A-N-N, at ectutoring.com. I can answer any additional questions for you outside of this webinar. Thank you so much. And I will put it back to you, Wayne. Thank you. That was great, Ann. Really great, Thanks. very practical, very helpful. I picked up a lot of tips and strategies. Um, and of course, awesome. there are lots of specific questions. One is, do you use rewards for achieving tasks in homework? If so, what, what have you found to be effective? I like using rewards if it's something that um, they may want that's not a tangible item. For example, some kids will work really hard for time on the Xbox or time on the computer computer um, or video games. It kind of depends on the age, but I think that type of reward is better than giving them something because rewards can be stale over time, especially if you're giving them something like candy or um, I don't know, something else that's a tangible thing. Mm -hmm. It might get boring after a while, so you kind of have to up the ante. Yeah. So if you can find something that they want to do, they want to go to a movie or you pick mm -hmm. them up for ice cream, that's often a little bit better than um, having, you know, a lot of parents will say, I use a sticker chart. Great, if your child likes stickers, but it could be they like stickers for a month and then you're on to something else. Right, right. Uh any suggestions on how to help kids remember to bring their homework home from school? I guess their homework assignments. Sure, there's a couple of things depending on the age. So for an elementary schooler that has, usually elementary schoolers will have a homeroom class. I've done a couple of things that have been helpful. One is I put a box topper, just like some kind of visual at the foot of their desk. Um, it could be like a little grocery bag they have or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the idea is anytime they get in a homework assignment, it just put it on the top of that box top. So at the end of the day, just throw everything into your backpack. Don't worry if it's organized or you have your desk divided so that um, one side is desks is your books and the other side is stuff that you need to bring home so at the end of the day you just pull that out but the idea is you need a system um, as kids get older and they have a locker i found the best thing is that they have a shelf specifically dedicated to homework so when they leave the class and they have a homework assignment Instead of putting it back in their backpack, put it on that one shelf. So at the end of the day, they just take everything off that shelf and throw it in their backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, one mom asks, uh, what do you do when a 12-year-old needs constant reminders to start working on homework or studying for a test? I find myself functioning as his frontal cortex all the time. Do you let him fail? Well, I got this idea from Sharon Weiss, and, and I love it because I've worked with a lot of kids um, in a more of a tutoring or coaching situation that needed a lot of reinforcement. So she'll ask, um, and, and you can ask your child, how many reminders do you think you'll need from me? And, you know, if, they're, you, if you're having to remind them typically like 15 times, that's not good. So hopefully they'll say like, I don't know, three, and you say, great. Today, I'm gonna to remind you three times and I'm gonna put down three chips. And every time I remind you, I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna move this chip over to a separate place of the desk. Maybe the chips are in a cup. So put the chips out so they're visual. Um, this is a reminder, so it's a visual. Because kids often don't remember. It, it, it's one in one ear out the other. Verbal reminders are not, they're just not as good as a visual reminder. So if there's a system where it's a visual, 
you know, I think that that's far superior. So ask how many reminders and have some type of chip system. And it's also okay to say, just remember, this is the last reminder that I'm going to give you. It's up to you to start your math homework or to finish your math homework, whatever it might be. And I think it's perfectly okay to say, um, remember homework in our house is done by whatever time you pick, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, whatever. So if it's not done by then, you're gonna have to put it away and you'll have to turn it in like this tomorrow. I found it usually takes three days for kids not to like that feeling of going to work, going to school without their work done, to kind of change their ways. But it puts, instead of you having all the responsibility, it starts to give them the responsibility, which is ultimately what you want as they get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, lots of parents saying that their kids just don't want to be helped in any form or fashion. Um, so at what point should parents maybe consider a tutor and, and get them out of this, out of the mix of the, the homework? Well, if you find that your relationship is being defined by academics, it's time to bring somebody else in. Um, you, I mean, I, I, even as a teacher, um, I can do all of these things. I work with lots of parents and kids on these things. But it was way harder for me to help my own kids just because I have this relationship with them. And because I'm the, it wasn't my message, it was the messenger, me. And so I've, I found that it's been chronic. It's not something new that cropped up last week, which it probably isn't. And you feel like you no longer have the parent-child relationship. It's like this relationship about grades and academics. Right. That's when I would bring somebody else in. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about um, bringing homework home. What about returning it to class? Uh, this one mom asks, uh, she had an idea actually. My thought is that we have a checklist that the teacher checks off to ensure he turned it in. And then I know if he didn't turn it in, uh, we can work on it and turn it in the next day. I mean, a lot of times these kids, you know, these assignments aren't turned in, and but it sometimes gets to a point where they're of no return. Uh, they have all these assignments and, and they're failing. So, well, you have any strategies for that? Or do you like this, this particular strategy? Yeah, I love that way. And I would yeah. say first, make sure you have a system. So you use a homework folder. You need a foolproof method to know that your child is getting to class and the homework is in the place where they know it is every day and they just actually don't physically take it out and give it to the teacher. I bring it up to the teacher and, and say, this has been a chronic problem because I gotta think that her child isn't the only one that has this problem. Um, I've seen this throughout the years a lot. And, and part of the reason is that teachers have different protocols. For example, one teacher, when you walk in, it might be you're supposed to put it in the basket. The other teacher calls for it. Another teacher, you just check it in class and you don't turn in. The third teacher, um, you might pass it to the homework leader. There's all different ways that teachers want homework. So I would definitely talk to the teacher and if she's been consistent with her, I would ask her, how would I be able to know that he's turned it in? Instead of giving her the answer, I might ask her the question, what's a good way for me to know? Um, because I'm not always sure when I ask my son. Mm -hmm. uh, should the parent go to school and bring in the homework if the child forgets it at home? This is a mom asking. I guess, I guess the toss up is, you know, him, well, not failing, but getting in trouble for not turning it in or her actually returning it for him and, and the sense of responsibility that might not be learned if she didn't. So, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people, yeah. I think a lot of people would say, absolutely not. Never, you know, <laughs> setting a bad precedent. But mm -hmm. personally, I think, I mean, I've brought my kids homework to school before. Uh, but I've also prefaced it by, I'm going to bring your homework to school for you twice this semester. This is one time, just so you know. 
And I like that approach because, it, again, puts the ownership back on the child. You got one strike. Right. <laughs> you know, you might say, I will bring it to you three times this year. It just makes kids more aware of it. And it puts the responsibility in their court. But again, I make sure that they have a system for where it goes every night. Because if they have a system, they should be able to do that themselves. But I think every once in a while, like, this is how life, like, I don't know, I've gotten to work where I've forgotten an important folder. Right. It's just how life is. So I kind of cut kids a break a little bit more, but I would preface it by saying, you've got, I will bring it to you X amount of times. And you really, really have to stick to that so that they can take ownership. Mm -hmm. This one mom builds in five minute breaks on the homework uh, session. So work, take five minutes, work for 20 minutes. And, but her daughter doesn't, um, doesn't adhere to the five minute rule uh she goes beyond whether it's listening a song or or playing playing a game for five minutes um do you have any any practical strategies or any that would might help her adhere to the five minutes i might ask i might have a conversation with child. i mean depending on their age if it's a first grader it's harder to have a conversation with a first grader than a fourth yeah, grader right but, say i noticed that you and i love using the words i've noticed they're just <laughs> For some reason, they're magic words with kids. Instead of you, which is just right away puts kids on the defensive, I've noticed that um, the breaks tend to be short for you, that five minutes um, might not be a good amount of time because you seem to be going over without, but even when I remind you, what would be a good amount of time for a break? And maybe the daughter says 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, how would you know that it's time to get to work after the 10 minutes? Oh, a timer would be helpful. Okay, great. How would you set the timer? So I would have them, I would ask them all the questions and have them figure it out. It's not a parent's job to be a taskmaster and to, you know, make sure they have a five minute break. And basically it's a part-time job. You know, I would put that again, put the responsibility a little bit in the child's court if they're a little bit older and they can handle that. And ultimately, you know, again, have a cutoff time for homework. It's okay to say homework in our house is done by X time and everybody's putting everything away. Mm -hmm. Here's another parent that came up with a strategy. Stay after school and get some help from the teacher. My son started doing this in middle school and teachers loved it. Um, you were a teacher. You also worked with hundreds and hundreds of kids. Do you find that um, effective for some kids? I think it's brilliant, absolutely. And I mentioned that on one of the last slides that a lot of schools they have homework clubs or they will allow kids to stay after school. And absolutely, I mean, that's just like free help. You know? And it's by the person who knows how it's been taught. So I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I would, as long as the school will allow it, I would keep doing that. And if your child says, I don't need to do this anymore, say, let's try this on a trial basis. Um, how about if you if you want to do homework at home, um, we'll try it for two days and see how it goes. But I wouldn't allow them just to say, I'm done with this. You know, I'm just going to do homework. Always, instead of, so to give that safety net, chip away at it. Say, well, we'll change it for this day or a couple of days or maybe a week so that they can take responsibility. Um, but I absolutely think that's a brilliant idea. One mom seems to have sort of a, well, she has a daughter who, who um, as soon as the homework sheets come out, uh, she begins to cry. Well, she just finds some of the stuff too hard. She doesn't know how to start the homework, and the mom doesn't know exactly what to do. It seems like a bigger, you know, a bigger strategy session to try to maybe talk with the teacher. Uh, I don't know, but her level, she seems to run into problems right away and says it's too hard. She throws the pencil down in frustration. So uh, is there any, what can this mom do? Well, I guess my question would be, is, is, is the work too hard? Because if it is, the student needs a lot of accommodations. Right. Um, you know, I've worked with lots of kids where they've brought home work that is just way above their ability. And can they do it? Yes. But it's just absolutely painful. And I just don't see any benefit to that. So I would first try to answer the question, 
can she do this without help? Like if you didn't help her at all, is, are her cognitive skills good enough to actually do this work? Um, if, she, if the answer is no, then I'd absolutely go back to the teacher and ask for accommodations. And again, use the words I've noticed. I've noticed that once we take out homework, Susie is breaking down in tears because she feels so overwhelmed. Right. Is it possible to have a reduced assignment, meaning instead of 10 questions, there's five, or um, could she get an other, another assignment that's a bit easier for her? Um, could you get her started in class? For a lot of kids, it's just getting them started, and then once they're over the hump, it's not that bad. So that could be another option as well. Okay. A lot of parents, believe it or not, have worked, have used the time timer with their children, but apparently when they leave the room, uh, they change the time. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I guess there are no suggestions for that other than a webcam, but um, uh, there are a lot, there, there, there are some problems with it. Uh, do you have any, any sort of fail, foolproof uh, strategies for this? I've had kids do that with me too. Like I've gone out to go to the bathroom and then I come back and <laughs> change the time. Um, and I ultimately say, oh, I noticed. Uh -oh. I noticed. I seem to be different. <laughs> oh, um, did you happen to change the time? Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why? I'm just curious. Why did you do that? And, and they'll say, well, I don't really want to do this or something like that. I'm like, you know, ultimately, this is your homework. Um, you choose the amount of time. So perhaps this is not a good amount of time for you. What do you think might be a good amount of time for you? And I just throw it back in their court and let them decide because it could be the time we think is right for the child actually might be too long. And maybe it needs to be a shorter amount of time. Or maybe I also work with super anxious kids that just do not like the timer. They just are adverse to the timer. And if that's the case, I don't even go there with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we might try a couple of different timers um, and it's just not a fit. Um, but I will say in general, a physical timer tends to be better than the timer on the phone because the timer on the phone just can be distracting. If the child gets a text message or whatever, or something crops up, it's hard to get back. Right. Um, right. Um, what about, I mean, you talked about rewards. What about... Um, punishments if they don't do I think I know the answer but I mean punishing a child for not doing homework uh, doesn't seem well, very fruitful yeah I haven't found great success with punishments I found success with consequences and I think maybe mm. when parents are you know punishment maybe they are thinking more about a consequence which is actually better so a consequence would be um, I don't know what you want them to do look you need to um, in order to um, watch TV tonight, the homework needs to be, your math homework needs to be completed. And so the consequence is that they don't watch TV, or maybe the consequence is instead of watching an hour of TV, which was agreed upon, maybe they just get to watch a half hour of TV. But I like the if then, if you get this done, or if you do this, then you can do that. So the if then tends to work better than go to your room or you're not going out this morning, this weekend or I'm taking your phone away. You're so distracted. Taking phones away, like all of those things, although they feel better in the moment to the parent. I mean, I know <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but sometimes the punishment is feeling like, oh, good, I'm done. But ultimately, it doesn't put the responsibility back on the child. It just makes them mad. And, and I haven't found a great situation to come from that. So I think the if then thing tends to work a little bit better. Right. Um, a lot of a lot of questions about procrastinating. Some moms make make the kids uh, make their children do the homework right after school because they say it only gets worse as time goes on. But sometimes even when they allow them to do it after dinner, they procrastinate. I know you sort of address that. You linked procrastination with anxiety and I don't know what about a, a child who really procrastinates you know mm -hmm. most, most of the evening yeah. well there's a couple things you can do one is the order in which they, kids do things has a, a big effect on their procrastination so um, I get this question a lot because I travel around to schools and I do presentations for parents and 
and typically parents will say, well, what's the best order? Should they? I think they should start with the hardest assignment because then you get something really hard out of the way and it's smooth sailing. But my husband thinks you should start with you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I think. If you have a completely homework adverse child who just doesn't want to do anything, I think your best entry um, to getting something done is to start with the easiest assignment. So consider that, like consider starting with the easiest assignment. That might kind of get them going. Um, if you have a kid who they'll do the easy things on their own, but they always procrastinate writing because for some reason ADHD and writing, probably because of the working memory thing, kind of go together. Um, you might um, uh, help them get started with that. For example, if there's something your child always procrastinates on, figure out, okay, how can I get, how can I help my child just get started? Because saying, go write that essay is counterproductive. They're just not going to do it because mm -hmm. it feels overwhelming and they don't know how to get started. So you might say to them, okay, what might you want to write for a topic sentence? And they say, Blah, 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 blah. Great. And just type it for them. Get them started. Mm -hmm. Let them tell you, dictate it to you. Then say, what might you want for your second sentence? Type that. Say, what about the third one? They type that. How about the fourth one? They type that. And it just kind of gets them going. And sometimes if you have a serious procrastinator, they may need you to just launch them into getting started. Um, I found that to work really well. I had this situation with one of our tutors, um, she's working on a college essay with a student, and she said, I don't know why he didn't do it. I told him to write a rough draft of his essay, and he didn't do it. And I said, because it's too overwhelming. He's just, I will tell you, he will not do that. You know, you, you need to have him just write um, the topic out and three ideas that he has, or write the topic sentence, or something so easy. And that's really how you get started. That's very good advice. Um, I guess, lastly, do you have any homework or know of any homework planning sheets or weekly planning sheets that, that are very effective? Sure. Um, well, a lot of kids have assignment notebooks, but I found that they won't always write in assignment notebooks. If you have a kid who hasn't written down their assignments for years, they're just not going to do it. Right. So, a couple of apps on the phones. Um, one is called iHomework. Another one is My Homework. And both of them actually have block scheduling because around here, a lot of middle schoolers have block scheduling where instead of having um, you know, seven classes a day, they have three classes or four classes a day and they're just longer and they rotate days. Um, so I like those apps because sometimes kids are more willing to use their phone to track assignments. I've also gotten kids um, the, a teacher's plan book because a teacher's plan book has the subjects on the right and then it has the days of the week. And for some reason, kids like the teacher's plan book mm -hmm. for some reason. And it allows them to look at their week at a time instead of the day. And I found that to be super helpful for kids um, because it's, again, it's that week at a time that's so valuable and much better than a day. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the hour's up, Anne. Um, that was okay, great anyway. stuff. I really loved Thank it. You so much I'm me. Uh, thanks so much for being here and sharing your expertise. I'm sure the attendees loved it as well. And, uh, We'll have to have you back to do something else. I would love it. Thank okay. you. All right. Uh, and for everyone else, I hope you will attend next week's webinar on September 18th with Chris Dendy. We'll talk about what teachers should know about maximizing learning in the classroom for students with ADHD and LD. And on September 25th, Roberto Olivardia will explain the relationship between ADHD and sleep and how important sound sleep is to optimizing the ADHD brain. So I wanted to thank everyone for attending today and have a great day.